Alex, my drink of the day is a lot of coffee. <laughs> Why that? I really have, have to let it carry me through the episode. <laughs> I think at some point I will definitely stop drinking. I feel it. I feel it on the horizon that I'm not ready anymore to get through this roller coaster of dopamine rush and bad feelings the next day just for some for a few hours of drinking alcohol. It's just not worth it for me. So you drank too much. Last no, night. not not even too much. It's just doesn't matter the amount. But if I drink just a little bit, then my sleep is super bad and I'm sleep deprived. And then I think sleep is my most important resource. <laughs> and whenever yeah. I I didn't sleep a lot, then I I get nothing really functions in my body. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sounds not good. Yeah, but that's what this podcast is for. To also go on our own journey of becoming so more sober, curious than we've been in the in the beginning when we started it. And this is actually a really interesting transition to what we are going to speak about today because we are also going to have a look at what happens exactly in the brain when you drink. This dopamine rush that is something total logical, totally, totally logical. And what else do we have? Uh, we will talk about the different definitions of alcohol-free in some countries and the problems that might come, al come along with that. And in the end, we will not only have one drink of the week, we will have a whole section talking about wine and food pairing. Oh, so yes. Have fun. Have fun. Welcome, 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 all you curious people, no boozers and wine lovers, to the ninth episode of Double O, your weekly go-to show about non-alcoholic products in the podcast universe. So, we entered a new era last week. We wanted to introduce a new section, and this is what we start with, Sober Celeb. Who do we have yes. this week? It's my absolute favorite actress. And I think you also know her. I think she's super hot, but she's also extremely nice. And I love her relationship with her husband. Can you think of the person I'm talking about? It's Blake Lively. Blake Lively. Did you watch Gossip Girl? <laughs> uh, every now and then. It's, I, I hardly remember it, but yes. That really carried me through my school age. <laughs> and yeah, for, for Blake, some of you might know her from her own sparkling soda brand that she launched recently, which is called Betty Bus. And for Blake, she never really started drinking, so she didn't really have to give up on drinking. And she also said that she never tried a drug. And she doesn't really need to strictly forbid herself anything or enforce anything. But she just genuinely doesn't have the desire for. Which is, I think, very, very interesting. And also very rare in the Hollywood scene. Do you think she gets high on Ryan Reynolds? Oh, I would, I would be <laughs> so high on <laughs> Ryan Reynolds. <laughs> But I would also be high on my own mirror reflection if I was Blake Lively. <laughs> She's just so beautiful. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That's my girl crush. Yeah. Speaking about Gossip Girl, Alex, I have some, some questions for you. Like mm -hmm. this and that questions. Are you team New York or team LA? For the people who are watching, this question seems a bit stupid probably because i'm wearing a new york knicks hat i'm definitely team new york okay are you a dreamer or a realist realist 
Do you have to decide whether to go left or right? Or does it depend on the tendency? Yeah, I mean, if you have like, dependencies on certain situations, then you can maybe quickly. I consider myself being an optimist, and this is something in between. So sometimes I tend to dream, sometimes I look more on the realistic side of things. But if I have to do one direction, I would say dreamer. Nice. Hmm. Are you a mom or a dad child? Like, who who's your favorite? Who is your favorite or who I was the favorite for? I don't know. <laughs> um, you mean what? where the, the stronger connection is? Oof. Yeah. This is tough. I guess it... Yeah, um... and sometimes it, it also changes in the course of your adolescence. Oh, I would say it's more on the mom side and but yeah when I turned older um there was a a switch probably um direction of my dad because you get in this technical thing you have this sports thing and um for example I told you about the the old timer um I bought in mm -hmm. I don't know when I was 25 or something and then the restoration I did with my dad so There was another connection. Yeah, I mean, at, at least you are balancing your <laughs> your love out. <laughs> so yes, all about balance. Every part. Nice. Are you rather overthinking it or do you just live and go with the flow? Oh, I, I won't put this in the same question because overthinkers tend to uh, think so much about stuff they don't that they don't do it not at all or don't decide anything and just go with the flow means uh sometimes you make decisions without thinking at all and i would say i'm more on the live and let go side but with before or let's say you know i'm a science guy you know i, I look at the mm -hmm. on, on the data and then i take my decision sometimes it's gut feeling but most probably it's based on on facts i know but I don't overthink it 25 times. And this okay. has changed as well. Two left, summer or winter? Summer. Thriller or documentary? Documentary. And sometimes a documentary can be an amazing thriller. True crime and wine. Yeah. For example. Yeah, that can be really, really uh, euphoric. Which brings me very bad transition, I know. It brings me to my really, really hard topic because I was doing this research also to understand more what happens in my brain when I drink and why do you sometimes not stop drinking? <laughs> and yeah, the, the reason behind is when we drink alcohol, there are some brief initial euphoric feelings associated with it and the first part of the brain impacted by alcohol is the prefrontal cortex where the judgment judgmental area and the decision making systems are are housed and alcohol artificially stimulates the brain's reward center causing the dopamine response that creates a desire and a need for the substance. So you want more and more and more because it's like a reward. You, you are getting positive feelings from it. And by the way, dopamine is a neurotransmitter, which means it's a chemical messenger that carries signals between brain cells and communicates information throughout the body. And dopamine is the learning chemical and not the pleasure chemical, which means it tells the brain, do this again, do this again, do this again. And that's how dopamine works. So it's absolutely baked into using the substance that we will do more of that. Yeah, we will do more of that is intended, desire more and occasionally throw our best intentions out the window. And that also happened to me last night. <laughs> <laughs> I never eat. <laughs> I never eat like chips and stuff like that. But when I drink, 
it's like my these whole intentions are just gone and it's because it it really yeah has this powerful effect of activating your re reward circuits and then flood the brain with dopamine and that produces this euphoric feeling or what, is, what we recognize as feeling buzzed what is this substance in chips in is chips it, is it the sugar I mean, the, is it the, the spices yeah and the salt and the so you can also eat salty carrots or salty apples yeah but most of the time you don't really serve apples or carrots at a party <laughs> Can you imagine you're on a party and your dopamine kicks in and you go to the fridge, you get a glass of water and eat a carrot? <laughs> and everybody's like, what the hell? <laughs> She that had too much. Be Stop my, her. my best me would do that. But my yesterday me was like, oh, yeah, just have the tortillas. Anyways, <laughs> the That's dopamine cool. activates your memory circuits in other parts of the brain that remember this pleasant experience and leave you thirsting for more and then over time the problem is that alcohol causes the dopamine levels to decrease leaving you feeling miserable and desiring more alcohol to feel better and that's why we always feel so shitty the next day and that's why we also always continue drinking although we might have had enough. The research goes on. The brain uses billions of neurotransmitters to manage everything from our breathing to our heartbeat to our digestion. And while drinking initially boosts the person's dopamine levels, the brain adapts to the dopamine overload with continued alcohol use. And it starts to produce less of the chemical and reduce the number of dopamine receptors in the body and increase dopamine transporters. And those are little transporters that remove excess dopamine in the spaces between the brain cells and they just carry away your dopamine. And then <laughs> your <the laughs> dopamine levels are, yeah, are decreased and that's directly impacting your mood. That's and crazy. that's also the reason why alcohol addicted people consume even more alcohol in an unconscious effort to boost their dopamine levels and get the spark back. But the level has adjusted. And really interesting, the study found out that men exhibit a greater release of dopamine when they drink than women, which means or which also explains why men are more often abusing alcohol and get addicted than women so we get addicted f in a faster way quicker yeah oh, crazy yeah because the and the more you consume the higher are your risks for intoxication and that's why why drinking alcohol also impacts your inflammation it impacts your gut microbiome it impacts everything it's just not good and that's also why the world health organization has stated that there is no safe amount of alcohol to consume that's a bummer <laughs> basically it was when it this came out in 2023 it was a uh, it was in every news and it was it was quoted in many many studies as well of course but also it's I mean, it's not just talking about alcohol. Alcohol is not just a substance. I mean, it's it's a part of a cultural movement of culture. I sat together with some friends last night and just this, I, I was drinking the rosé from Moderato. And, and, and in one minute they realized, that, is this alcohol free? And I said, yes. But why? Then you can just drink grape juice. And then I always answer the same. I say, this is what they all say. <laughs> And then yeah, the interesting really is. thing is when you when you keep on talking to them, you realize that most of them they claim they don't drink alcohol for for the booze, for the for the buzzy feeling. They drink it for the taste. But in the end, when you say, okay, let's say it tastes totally the same without the alcohol, I won't drink it. Yeah. People really 
love to lie to themselves and love to see it as a <laughs> as a cultural heritage, which it yep. is. But it's also a cultural heritage for specific reasons. And we shouldn't ignore that. Definitely. I heard a really interesting definition of the, the people that are basically interested in those kind of products and those alcohol free movements. And if you're not sober at all, or if you don't have health issues, there's, I, I would say you can divide it in two different sections. The one are the sober curious people mm -hmm. that are, like you said, you mean, you get curious, is this a thing? Could this, could this be something for me? Then you discover I have problems all the time I drink. So you, I would say, are the, the sober curious person and me personally i always say drink less but better i'm more this mindful drinking guy and maybe one day i will discover i love pinot but uh, i don't know one bottle of pinot a year is totally fine and the rest is just boostery stuff that's it yeah but don't get me wrong i also found a good way of drinking moderately but it there are some criteria that have to be in place i always have to have water ideally i have electrolytes ideally i sleep a lot like the normal amount of hours that i usually do and then it's all fine then i don't have any effects of the alcohol at all but as soon as i go to bed too late and i have that that lack of sleep because my body still wakes up at the same time no matter when i went to bed then the hit hits the fan. But isn't it weird to prepare for a night out uh, the same way you do for a marathon? <laughs> you know, I prepared yeah. my water bottle and I did some training beforehand and I need eight hours of sleep and I have my electrolytes ready. Huh? It's so much effort. That's why I probably yeah. will will just stop drinking at some point because it's so much effort it's so much energy that I, that is flowing into preparing me for not getting a hangover that i could just leave it it's not in in relation anymore there might be a solution <sighs> trending on social media for you at the moment it's called breakfast I pinot know. have you heard of it ah yeah i've heard of that but i thought you you are <laughs> referring to the hangover cure Oh, no, but, but this is another thing. It's the one where we talked about uh, recently. No, um, I'm talking about breakfast Pinot. People are claiming it's a good idea to drink a Pinot in the morning. And I mean, if you just have a look on your uh, energy level of the body, uh, dopamine, or, um, the production of everything you need for the day, and then preparing yourself to go to sleep, it might be a good idea to have one glass during the day and not closely before you go to sleep but i won't recommend to drink a pinot noir in the morning <laughs> and i'm a pinot guy because i think I, i i would be afraid that the people who have a glass of wine in the morning are not able to stop due to the fact that you have just described uh, through the eyes of science yeah definitely it just gets you in that circle that you can't really break out of And I mean, we've all done boozy brunches and stuff like that, but eventually you either you go out and go to a festival or, or something. So you your energy level is naturally high. But if you were to go home after a boozy brunch, you would probably just lay down because your <laughs> your energy level is <laughs> the people go deep. and the energy leaves with them. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have my electrolytes, but <sighs> well done. Okay. Talking about intoxication, I read some interesting stuff the last couple of days, and it was all about the question is it a good idea to drink alcohol free stuff when you have specific, I, I would call it issues, so health issues, or you, you're just pregnant or you are the driver or some stuff like that. And what does alcohol free really mean? And we talked about this article from, what was it? From Belgium, I guess, where the brewer stated we need stricter rules because there is beer sold in, in Belgium that is stated as alcohol free, but it's from different countries and their interpretation is totally different. And just to give you two I'm numbers. Netherlands. It was in Netherlands, okay. Yeah. Just to give you two numbers, 
the same product labeled as alcohol free from the UK would have less than 0.05 ABV. And the same product from, what was it, Finland would have 2.8% ABV. And this is a big range. And it's, it's, isn't it scary? By the way, what is But ABV? the Finnish people, you also have to understand them. It's very dark. It's cold most of the time. Come on, really? Don't take away the alcohol. <laughs> no, I don't accept that. Sorry. But what, what does ABV mean, by the way? ABV means alcohol by volume. And it's the proportion of alcohol in the drink compared to the total volume of the drink in percent. Yes. Sounds a bit awkward, doesn't it? But basically the idea is to talk about percentages to get it more um, feelable for the people. Instead of comparing uh, 50 milliliters of alcohol in a glass of wine versus 200 milliliters in a whatever bottle of beer. You know what's funny? I mean, we're, we're Germans. We were born and raised in Germany. And the expression in Germany is called percent. V-O-L, voll, and voll means drunk in German. <laughs> this is this was my, uh, this, these were my thoughts when I was younger. I was like, oh, they even write it down on the can. <laughs> there's, a five, <laughs> there's a 5% possibility that you get drunk when you have this. Ah, oh, you thought that's what it meant. No, but I mean, yeah. <laughs> that was kind of an interpretation. <laughs> No. But basically, um, just to give you some facts, um, generally speaking, science knows that the human body is able to process about 10 milliliters of alcohol or 8 grams per hour. And when you have a 200 milliliter drink of a drink that has 0.5 alcohol or less, there is one milliliter of pure alcohol. So when you have, moderately speaking, a drink, an alcohol-free drink, less than 0.5, The alcohol, uh, sorry, the intake is less than your body is able to process. And then this is totally fine. And this gets a problem when you uh, inhale more alcohol, when you drink more alcohol, then your body is able to process. But what if you're an, an alcoholic? I mean, could that still throw you back into addiction when you drink a non-alcoholic drink like a, or a de-alcoholized wine? Yeah, this is general. Or does question. this depend on which country you're in? <laughs> in Finland, you would probably be yeah re re addicted. I don't know if that's the right. I mean, right you word. can you can make some 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 fun about that. That there is even other definitions in countries of what is what is it called being addicted? Uh, what is it like being addicted? But generally speaking, when the process is happening, you just described, and your dopamine kicks in. And your body thinks, this is good, give me more, give me more, give me more. And then your level is um, influence and um, you have this feeling. <laughs> the interesting thing is, you know that this is wrong, but your body tells you, give me more because I like it, I want it. And you also know that there is intoxication, um, but you accept it because you say, once at a time, this is totally fine. And I mean, we've all been younger and you said you had your, what was it? Boozy brunches. I've never had that. <laughs> But I mean, <laughs> Maybe we, it's we a met one thing. year to go on a walk and just have beers after beers. So yeah, basically, as you said, we, we grew up, our, our generation, Generation Y millennials, they grew up with alcohol being part of their culture. And this is changing with Gen Z because there are so many people that have never drunk any alcohol and This will continue in the future and this will change the whole mindset. And if you are addicted or if you have health issues with um, with alcohol or you're just pregnant, uh, of course, you on the one hand have to consider your doctor. Please always consider your doctor. On the other hand, there is always people saying if it's less than 0.5, it's considered to be okay at least through the eyes of health, of science. But on the other hand, there's also this psychological effects, especially when you were addicted and you try to become sober, it could be a trigger. You have the smell, you have the, the look and feel is always the same. I mean, 
we need the look and feel of a wine bottle to sell this stuff as de alcoholized wine because if we put it in cans nobody would buy it and this can also trigger it's it is what it is unfortunately and um i mean when when you know that uh for example bananas or even baby porridge has sometimes has due to the fact how it's how it's manufactured more alcohol because it's some parts ferment uh, than uh, an alcohol free wine your mindset might change there's an interesting list that is published every i don't know three to five years from the ministry of health in germany where they list all the substances all the fruits and beverages that have that contain alcohol sometimes by not by definition or on purpose just because of the the manufacturing and the list is so funny i mean of, of, of course it's fruits it's ripe fruits kiwis bananas baby porridge surprised me a lot um soy sauce rice it's super interesting and sometimes scary at the same time yeah isn't it the same with sulfites that everyone's always complaining that the sulfites in the alcohol is what causes the headache. <laughs> Whereas in, I think it's ketchup and it's a lot of sodas. They, they also contain, we, we should maybe double check that, but I'm <laughs> having this half knowledge here. They also contain so much, sul so many sulfites that it's way worse than drinking a glass of wine. It is, and in, my, in terms of sulfites, de de depending on the drinks. Uh, I mean, for example, many of us know these dried fruits you can buy. Um, I don't know in, in in bags from from there's this German brand Seeberger, but I guess it's available in other countries as well. So dried peaches, and the sulfur level is five to ten x higher than a normal drink that has mm. uh, a normal wine that has been, let's say, handcrafted, especially when you go to this low intervention area. Um, and there's also studies that show that you can also get headaches of a lower sulfur level because sulfur is responsible or is added for microbiological stability. And if this mm. is not the case, you might get headaches. It is what it is. Yeah. So, so what's the general rule in the EU or in Europe or? Actually, it's worldwide. Um, when, okay. when people talk about um, alcohol-free worldwide, they base on this scientific fact I just mentioned that 0 0.5 means too few alcohol to get your liver in problems. <laughs> Let's put it like this. So 0 0.5 is worldwide accepted as alcohol-free. You cannot use the name in some countries. For example, in Germany, you cannot label alcohol-free wine if it's just below 0 0.5, but you can write, you can write down um, the alcoholized wine, for example, but you can mention less than 0 0.5 and then you're in the range at least. And then there is another, this, um, I would say it's accepted worldwide, but only few countries use it. It's called low, al low alcohol products. And this mm -hmm. is less than 1.2%. And then there is countries that have a different interpretation we just mentioned finland or iceland is quite close with 2.25 um if you're interested uh in what your country has defined as alcohol free and low alcohol we put the original study of okaro and lachmeyer from 2022 in the show notes super interesting because almost nothing has changed so if you look it up there's i guess two or three changes in total worldwide and this is the current list put it in the show notes um canada 0.4 is a bit lower Uh, also interesting, UK is 0.05, but there is a lot of discussions going on at the moment because they will change it. And you know what? It's not about the health issue behind, but it's about what marketing, what sales, what brand possibilities are available, will be available in the market, revenue-based, um, if you just put it up to 0.5. Doesn't it also have to do something with the taxes? Or the or the not at that level. Or... Not, not okay. at that level. Um, I mean, there is um, there is taxes and stuff, and especially when you have countries such as Germany, where is the tax system is a bit more difficult, especially when we talk about sparkling wines. Um, but nevertheless, 
the UK also changed its uh, its tax laws, and they st they still it's a huge thing at the moment in the UK. Uh, hopefully, I will get some some opinions tomorrow at the London Wine Fair. But yeah, it's a thing, and they started with zero point zero five, and the main reason was that UK has been struggling with many many health issues um, due to alcohol. And uh, they said it's a zero point five zero. Point, no, zero point zero five. Sorry, point zero five, and um, they will probably change it to zero point five. What is also interesting is there is a level zero point five in the Netherlands, but this is just for every drink except beer. For beer, alcohol free is one point uh, zero point one and lower. I don't know what the reason is for that. Maybe they they are a beer country and they just want to give more awareness. I don't know, but. This was super funny and interesting to me at the same time. And I mean, here we are just talking about Central Europe because it's a huge issue over here. And maybe we are a bit more concerned about alcohol. The US, Australia, we mentioned Canada, um, Australia and the US is 0 0.5. Um, super interesting is different markets. For example, when you look uh, to, to Asia or when you have a look at the the Arab countries, the Muslim countries, alcohol mm -hmm. is a huge thing over there because it's prohibited by religion. I mean, you are allowed, when you go to the Oman, Saudi Arabia, you are allowed to drink alcohol, but only as a foreigner and only in specific areas and specific places. It's totally protected. And it's not only just making your alcohol-free product and throwing it onto the market. It doesn't work because you need the halal certification and there's country uh, sorry there is companies at the moment earning money and assisting with the certification of your products being halal or not because it's a huge thing for the people living in that country i would love to compare their liver and their brain and neuro health to that of someone living in Europe <laughs> just to see if there are visible effects of alcohol because there are for sure. A hundred percent. And I mean, as let's say living in a modern world, we are quite familiar with names such as halal or I don't know, even the easier stuff, vegan, gluten-free. This is something that is quite normal for us. And um, it's even a normal thing to walk into a cafe and ask for uh, oat milk. Yeah, but but what does can you maybe explain briefly for the listeners what does halal mean? Yeah, sure. Um, basically, halal it, it comes from the Quran. Hopefully, I, I pr pronounce it correctly in English. Uh, but the Quran is uh, the the Bible of the Muslims, and um, I don't know if I'm even allowed to say that. <laughs> <laughs> No. So it's, it's the book, okay? It's the <laughs> book of the Muslims. And basically, halal is the definition for you are you have to prevent yourself from consuming substances that change your physical, your psychological, or your behavioral attitude. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the weird thing is that this is um, the interpretation is because, I mean, it's still the Quran. There's a lot of interpretation going on, of course. And it's it's weird because the general interpretation is if this happens on purpose. For example, I am producing wine, so I do the fermentation on purpose. This means this product, the final product, the wine is intoxicated. But for example, when I have bananas and I just leave them on the table for a week or two, and then after two weeks, they look like, I don't know, a brown sausage, they have, I would say, 0 0.5 to 0 0.8 of alcohol. You will be still allowed to eat that. Because what it about doesn't yogurt? There's so many things. The list is huge. I mean, when you look at, for example, when you have a look at soy sauce, soy sauce can have up to 1.2% alcohol. But it's just... Yeah, and it's, the... also, it's very, it's fermented. And that's yeah, why true. it's also not its like original. Um... But it's not for the sake of alcohol. It's for the sake of getting a sour sauce <laughs> to put in your rice. <laughs> and um, I mean, the um, basically you can divide it between um, a substance contains alcohol to preserve 
to store it or whatever, or alcohol with the purpose of intoxicating yourself. And this is the re the, 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 the case for wine, beer, and all this kind of stuff. Um, and uh, I mean, in the end, especially when you talk about people that um, are Muslim, that try to live uh, the halal way of life, they try to define it with the given rules and with their own interpretation. But it's all about this the feeling of security. When you are a very faithful person and you try to follow the rules that have been given by your religion, you try to make everything correctly, to do, to do everything right. And so what you do basically is you have a look at specific drinks, for example, talking about alcohol-free wine, you will have a look if there is a certific certificate saying this is alcohol-free. And I mean, if I buy a cucumber, nobody needs a sticker that this is vegan. Yeah, but if I have a, I don't know, a hummus or a fresh cheese or a yogurt, I need the sticker because there is possibilities that this can be vegan or this cannot be vegan. And it will be definitely the same with all this kind of products. And I'm pretty sure if you just check all the soy sauce producers, nobody would get the halal sticker. <laughs> and I mean, the good thing is this opens up brand new markets. Um, as a brand, as a wine brand, as a beer brand, because right now with this certification, you would be able to enter markets such as the Arab countries, Saudi Arabia, VAE, I don't know. Um, and, and Dubai is big in this, the Oman is big in this. So, um, and we will see many, many brands expanding and heading towards those markets. And it's quite similar with Asia or the Hindus. And tourism is a thing, fine dining is a, is a thing. And uh, it's not only for people who live in a country where the focus is the prohibition of alcohol. I mean, there's many, many Muslims living in Germany. There's even people considering this way of living, even though they might not be super Muslim oriented. If you have the possibility to put this label on your bottle, I'm pretty sure many people will. And um, talking about wine tourism, and fine dining uh, our drinks of the week usually were drinks that we discovered on our journey you had some events and you said oh man this is what i just discovered we went to in italy and said okay it was just grape juice but it was freaking crazy to have a grape juice with beetroot and today we said i had several tastings the last two weeks with alcohol free products and i discovered that there is uh especially in the last i don't know 12 months so many things have changed because there's a huge development. The focus is on quality and we will see, we see more and more products that the goal is not only to replace products with alcohol, with products without alcohol by adding sugar to give body and you know, give the people the feeling. I mean, the sugar level is high, but the calories is lower in sugar than in alcohol. So just enjoy it. There is products that have a very low sugar level that carry aromas that you, that are suitable for food pairing and in addition that bring complexity with them this is something that was the most surprising to me we talked about the sensual riesling last week and if you like off dry rieslings and i don't know asian food because it's sometimes spicy this Riesling is perfect for that. And I discovered so many things. And um, you said there is this German brand called Jörg Geiger. And many, many people know this brand. You just it's mentioned It's the first brand. that always comes to mind. And it's the one that is always mentioned when you talk about no alcohol wine. It's always like, have you tried Jörg Geiger? <laughs> the yeah. Bratbirne cham champagne? Yes. Is one of the Bruce most. Bruce Yeah. Thanks for that. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah and also, and also yeah. Colonne Null. I mean, they've been one of the first ones to be on that market. They are also always mentioned. And I'm talking about marketing right now, you still have, even though Germany especially is a quite mature market, you still have this feeling of many, many brands will be able to have this first mover effect and profit from that. And your Geiger did um, an amazing job in the last 10 years building his brand. Um, he, he, he built up a, a, a huge company and he was able to build or to buy his own cologne last year. So he has his own dealkalization machine right now because he has over 2 million bottles a year. 
And this is the same with Colonel Null. Colonel Null started as a small brand. They built up a huge brand. The name is present everywhere. They're now expanding to international countries and everybody knows it, even though my personal opinion, Colonel Null it's a, is a tough name for the American market. <laughs> Colonel Null. Yeah, maybe they call it Column. Column Zero. Column, column Zero. zero. Yeah. You, you could that do that. But it's all weird, yeah. But nevertheless, I mean, they, they build up a huge brand. And I would say Corona Null is more focused on B2C, easy drinking, everyday style. And the products are made like this, but on a lower sugar level. And your Geiger, for example, is more focused on gastronomy, wine and food pairing, because his products not only have wine as a base product, they also have natural aromas added. So what you get is super aromatic drinks. For example, I have, I have one here. Uh, which one is it? It's called 33. And basically, the, the base is Pinot Meunier. And then he added the juice of pears. And this is a product, when you open it, it reminds you of red berry pudding. You know that German Rote Grütze? It's totally crazy. It's like pff, a bunch of fruits. And then the it opens up new possibilities for wine and food pairing. For example, I know if you have... Um, a summer salad where you usually would add um, red berries or strawberries. You can just take this one and use the drink instead. Or when you, I don't know, when you are into meat or into good vegetables and you usually would add jam, just leave the jam and uh, take this one. Yeah. And you talked about yeah, so these. Sometimes it can be even better than a, than a regular wine. Different. I mean, it's tough to 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 compare, but I would say it's it's a different feeling. It's a different experience. Um, and um, you talked about the the champagne Bratbirne. Uh, two things to that. On the one on the one hand, he's not uh, allowed to call it champagne anymore. So oh. you can see C point Bratbirne because champagne is protected. Um, and basically, what it is, super interesting product, by the way. It's I won't put it in the sustainable corner, <laughs> but basically this is a bottle fermented pear wine. So you take high quality pears, then you make a base wine out of pears. Then you do a second fermentation in bottle for, I guess, 18 months. So you have a traditional method sparkling pear wine. Then you remove the alcohol. Then you add CO2 and uh, you add natural aromas. And I guess he, he uses um, pear juice to, to sweeten it. So it's super interesting. It's to me personally, it's very tasty. It's very interesting to uh, do experiments on wine and food pairing with cheese, with raclette, with fondue, with um, everything where, is, where you have, um, I would say, a higher fat level and you need the acidity and you can use the pear as a fruit component. Super interesting, but talking about sustainability, <sighs> tough product. <laughs> yeah, it's, it sounds like it's more effort to produce that than to produce an actual traditional method sparkling wine. Um, yeah, it is. And I mean, Actually, this is one of the few products where you have the the smell and the sense of a traditional method sparkling because you have this yeastiness in the nose because it mm -hmm. ran through a second fermentation. <sighs> yeah, I mean What's it's a great product. What's the sugar level? Four point two, uh, if I have it correctly in my mind. Four point six, forty six grams per liter, so quite high. It's the interesting thing is it has a lot of body, so it's almost full body for a sparkling wine, so quite interesting. And we talked about Senso. And there's another brand that uh, is very, very focused on wine food pairing that is super interesting to me. It's Moderato. Um, they have the La Cuvée Révolutionnaire. So this is the, the upper line, mostly focused on wine and food pairing. And, and what was most surprising to me with, this, with those products is that there is complexity. So when you are a wine geek and you're usually looking for layers and for wines where you can have a chat with friends for half an hour. So have you smelled this or oh, this structure, this complexity? I have layers of da 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 da. It's the nerdy corner, but yeah. with those kind of products, this is able. Uh, this is available. So, so you, you, this is possible. You can do that, and I like that. And for wine and food pairing, um, I have the the white over here. It's a columbar. And yesterday, uh, I cooked uh, asparagus. Perfect. 
It was just perfect. It has this herbal, uh, herbal, herbalness, herbs, <laughs> uh, green herbiness? fruit, oh, God. herbiness, herbiness Herbert. sounds good. Over. Yeah, there is herbs in it. <laughs> it smells like herbs, and um, this the green fruits. Uh, the acidity is, is is perfect. So this was for my for my asparagus. Mwah, love it, loved it, and um, we will see many many products coming up. Um, of course, more expensive. This is everything between 15 and 30 euros, but this is what I would expect of a well-made, high-quality product with alcohol. Yeah, and we will see what the future brings if people are uh, willing to pay 20, 30 euro for an alcohol-free product. We both will. Yeah, but I still hope that the price will be adapting to the to the better technologies and that we will see a slight decrease at least okay anything else any other product uh not over here what i want to mention is i mean you because we both are wine people uh, we usually talk about the alkalized wine nevertheless there is so many other products that are super interesting when we talk about alcohol-free drinks that can replace um alcoholic drinks or they can just work as a wine and food pairing or a food pairing component put it like this and we talk about kombucha we can talk about tea we can even talk about juices high quality juices this is an, a whole new section and there are even <sighs> rarer available um there will be some some tastings in the future i'm currently looking forward to a juice and tea tasting in three weeks so we will have some content coming up on that as well and tea by the way has only very, very low levels of alcohol or has never had any alcohol. And this is what it makes it more interesting as well because it can bring the complexity due to the components, to the uh, the herbals, uh, the herbs you use, the botanicals. And in addition, uh, the, let's say, more sustainable approach on making this product. Yeah, and sometimes you can even get the, the like, tannins, I think, Green tea yeah. and black tea, tea, black they, tea. They, they both have tannins as well. Yes, and we love tannins, don't we? <sighs> tannins are the best. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know that I'm a tannins trainer? <laughs> okay, this was awkward. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining this uh, amazing recording once again. Episode number nine is in the books yeah let us know what you think about this episode leave us a review if you liked it and we are always happy to see your comments and opinions and now we'll leave you into the new week start your week right by making conscious decisions ciao 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 ciao